definitely a hard act to follow. So, and uh, Steve mentioned, for those of you who are early risers, what you need to do next week to fill in your time, I know exactly what you need to do. Show up early and help set up, all right? Because we have 300 chairs like this to move outside, plus some other chairs and et cetera. We're, we're going to set up over about a 13,000 square foot area outside so we can accommodate, hopefully, uh, and hopefully it'll be a little bit like a family reunion, a family homecoming for Easter. And so we can have a lot more people than we normally do together in place. We're going to socially distance and do all that kind of good stuff, but, um, but it should be a great time. And again, note, it's at 10 30 next week. And for those of you who are working family plans afterwards for Easter, we're going to try to keep it right at an hour, right? And let me, let me emphasize again um, what Steve mentioned. Because we're going to be meeting on the parking lot, you really don't want to be the person who shows up at 1030 and everybody else is ready to start. And as they sing, they're inhaling your, your exhaust fumes, right? And hearing your door slam and et cetera. So try to be here on campus no later than 1015, right? So you can get out of your car, get parked, get to your chair, that kind of stuff. And we can start sharply at 1030, right? So love your neighbor next week by actually getting here a little early, right? So anyways, great. Hey, I want to start out with a little history lesson. And I don't know if there's anybody in this auditorium who would remember this, though we certainly have a few people who would who are in our church, because you'd have to be in your 80s to have a personal memory of this, right? Am I, is this me, Rick, or is that you? Am I ringing a little bit? It feels like I'm ringing. Let me see this photo, Jen. Let me see this photo, Jen. Yeah, nope, next one. Really? What happened to my... Dewey defeats Truman photo. So, oh boy. All right. All right. Well, the sermon's over. Everybody have a great week. All right. So, um, I was going to show you a picture of President Harry Truman on the morning after he was elected by himself. In other words, he didn't take over office after, LB, after Roosevelt died. But in 1948, he ran for president while he was serving as the acting president. And the Chicago Tribune, right, on that morning, because they wanted to be the first ones to press, based upon all the statistics they had, all the polling information they had, they were convinced that Thomas Dewey, who was running as a Republican, who was the governor of New York, they were convinced that he was going to win. And so they went... They, so. On the next morning, President Truman, newly elected to a second term in office, right, um, is holding the paper up. It says, Dewey defeats Truman, right? And it is a photo that will go down in infamy, right? It, 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 it memorializes the Chicago Tribune as a laughing stock, right? And, and so you'd have to be in your 80s, right, to be able to remember that firsthand. But here's why I bring that up. What do you think, all around the world today, churches are celebrating the Palm Sunday, the day when Jesus reached back into the Old Testament to prophecies coming out of Zechariah and Psalms of the Messiah that were coming out of the book of Psalms, and he, he lived those out and he went through a victory parade, right? A moment riding into Jerusalem where he was clearly communicating to anybody who knew anything about how God was going to work through the Hebrews that he was the Messiah. And as the kids read for us, people celebrated his arrival and they, would put, they took palm branches and laid them out in the road. And if they couldn't find one of those, they took off their jackets, or what the equivalent, their equivalent of a jacket, and laid down the road. So he rode into Jerusalem on a red carpet, on a donkey that had never been written, ridden. And and so ask yourself this question. What would the storyline have been if come the next Sunday morning, Jesus is still in the grave, that there is no Easter? What would the storyline have been? Instead of a moment of victory, it would have been that Jesus is still a victim. Right? He would have, that, that parade would have memorialized his failure. 
It was his claim to be the Messiah, and yet he just turned out to be another wannabe who was crushed by the system and whose bones are still lying in a tomb, rotting away. What changes all of that? What changes the laughing stock byline into a byline of victory? It's the resurrection. It's his resurrection leading to our resurrection. And, and, and the impact of the resurrection of Jesus, even on something like Palm Sunday, continues to echo down to us, and it's something that you and I really need to grasp because the resurrection changes everything. So we've been in a series on the resurrection out of 1 Corinthians 15. I'd love for you to grab your Bibles, and if you're at home, it's great to have you joining us this morning as well. You can take your tablet, or you can take your phone, or your, your, your scripture, and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And we've been looking at the effects, the impact of the resurrection. And we're, we're in, this is our third week. We have a couple weeks left. I think next week we'll talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Right? And then the week after, I'm going to talk about our resurrection at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then we'll wrap up our series, because I, I want to move into a series out of the book of Daniel. I'm going to take step my toe in the water of preaching out of prophecy. So actually, when we get to the prophecies, I'm going to go on vacation. I'll let Steve do that part. I'm just going to do all the great stories in Daniel beforehand. I'm off track. Here we go. We've been looking at three things so far. A couple things leading into our last. The, the first thing we looked at was that the resurrection of Jesus is really what puts the good news in the good news. Steve clarified for us the role of the resurrection in creating the gospel and what the gospel can mean for us and how critical it is for us to share with other people. But after that, Paul begins to move into a discussion of the ludicrousy of what we believe and what we do if Jesus is not resurrection. So as we've been war working through our text, and we're going to look at the second of those today, he's been working about just how ludicrous it is for us to believe what we believe about God, what it be, what it believe, what, for us to be teaching what we teach about Jesus, about God. He, that stuff is absolutely ludicrous. We have found ourselves to be liars, right? So the key verse that we've been kind of hubbing off of is verse 14 of chapter 15. Let me read this for you. I'm going to put it in, in, in just a little context. So let me start with verse 12. It says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? So then he begins to work out the implications, right? It's just like Palm Sunday without Jesus being resurrected on Easter. Changes the whole storyline, right? He says, well, you know what? You're going to change the whole storyline. The whole storyline of Jesus has changed if there is no resurrection of the dead. He says, because if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation, what we believe and what we teach about Jesus, right, is in vain. And we looked at that last week. So he's, what he says is that without the resurrection of Jesus, the storyline, the byline is changed. Instead of redemption from sin, savior, not vic victim, that the whole storyline gets rewritten. And everything that we teach about Jesus is false. We are liars about God. Our belief is useless. And Jesus is a victim of the system rather than a savior. And you and I, instead of being saved saints, we are still enslaved sinners without hope. And I can't go back and preach that whole message for us over again about it really does make a difference what we believe. But, it, but the whole storyline about what we preach and what we believe is transformed because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. But it's not just what we believe. He wants to go on and argue from, it's also about what we do, right? Look at the latter part of verse 14. It says, and if Christ has not been raised, our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Everything that you do to seek to be faithful to God as a result of the revelation of Jesus Christ, 
All of that is useless if Jesus isn't resurrected. The whole storyline, the whole byline gets changed from that of a, of a victory parade to a sad moment. It's a powerful word for us. And so Paul picks up what that really means for us in verse 29. And so this is where I want us to spend our time this morning. What does it really mean, related to our faith, that the byline of Palm Sunday is actually verified and validated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter? What does that mean for how you and I are going to live the rest of today and tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday? What what are the implications for us? What's the impact of that for us? So it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let me read verses 29 through 34. And again, so his whole argument has been around, related to the theology or the doctrine and how that's impacted if, you don't, if Jesus isn't resurrected. And then he's talking about all of the, the acts of faithfulness that flow from our faith, how those are all transformed, whether or not Jesus is resurrected or not. And the key verse is verse 20, right? He says, but now Christ has been raised. So let me read these verses. Otherwise... He says, what will they do who are being baptized for the dead? Yikes. We're going to come back to what that means. Otherwise, what will they do who are being baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are people baptized for them? Why are we in danger every hour? I face death every hour. As surely as I may boast about you, brothers and sisters, In Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus as a mere man, what good did that do me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If there is no resurrection, our whole approach to doing life is idiotic. We should do something different. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Come to your senses and stop sinning. For some people are ignorant about God, and I say this to your shame. Now, let me try to unpack this for us just a little bit, right? The Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Christ, is not a sad moment where another wannabe Messiah makes a claim to the role only to be relegated to the pages of history. Instead, it actually is a fulfillment of prophecy where God is riding into the midst of his people so that he can take them to be a part of himself. And what Paul begins to do here is he said, listen, think about it. If Christ has not been raised and there is no resurrection, Think about the things that you do in your, as a part of your pursuit of God and faith. He says, none of those things make any sense. He says, well, so why would you be baptized for the dead if Christ isn't raised? And he's flipping that argument and saying, but because Christ has been raised, what you do matters, right? It ha- makes sense. And so here's my, my first point, and I want to unpack this. Just so. The resurrection means that every act of faith that we do makes sense. Eternally, it's going to make sense. And he uses an example. It's really ironic to me that Paul uses an example to make his point that every act of faith makes sense because Jesus has been resurrected, but he uses an illustration that makes no sense to us at all. Right? What with this whole thing about being baptized for the dead? I will tell you, we are over 2,000 years removed from the moment in time when this was written, and scholars today still don't know what this means. Right? If you take it at literal value, face value, what it means is that there were individuals in the church at Corinth who were being baptized for people who had already died before. 
So they're baptized for the dead. That's the literal reading. It's a vicarious baptism. So, you know, your great-grandfather or whatever, you know, or your great-grandmother or obscure uncle or whatever, you know, in the bad, you know, you get baptized for them, right? And that's, that's probably the clearest reading of what this means. The problem with accepting that as an interpretation is that, one, we have no evidence anywhere in, scri- in Scripture or in church records that this was ever practiced by the church. Zero evidence, not even in Corinth. Secondly, this actually flies directly in the face of what Paul teaches the, about the meaning of baptism, that it's an act of confession of the person who has already believed. And you've got to go back over to Romans. So th- that just doesn't square with this idea that I, somehow something I do for somebody who's already dead somehow can have a spiritual impact. That, that just is not consistent at all with what Paul teaches about baptism. So you take what should be the most direct understanding, and you're going to say, you know, that just doesn't fit, and you set it aside. So what in the world does he mean? In all honesty, I don't really know, right? And neither does anybody else, right? And anybody who tells you that they do, they don't, right? But what's been kind of suggested is that he's using the terminology of the dead to remind the Corinthians that if Jesus isn't resurrected, they are still spiritually dead. Right? And so using that kind of imagery, he said, well, you know, if, if you're dead, why are you being baptized? Right? Because if Jesus isn't raised, there is no forgiveness. You don't become a new creature in Christ. You don't become a child of God. There is no new nature that you come. There is no, you are still in your sins. You are still spiritually dead. And therefore, why in the world are you being baptized if you're still dead? Right? And, but... Even though, I, and again, it's very ironic that the illustration that he uses to convince us that all of our acts of faith make sense because of the resurrection, he uses an illustration that we can't make sense of. <laughs> right? But it doesn't undermine his point. Everything that you and I do, and hear this clearly, everything that you and I do in our lives to pursue faithfulness to God makes sense sense. Listen, the Bible asks us to do some things. The teachings of Jesus teach us to do, ask us to do some things that are really counterintuitive. They just don't make sense to us. For example, right? Rejoice when you encounter various trials. When life gets hard, throw a party. Eh, that doesn't make a lot of sense to us. But because Christ has been raised, every difficult moment in our lives is an opportunity for spiritual learning and development, and so we should rejoice. Every act of faithfulness makes sense because Christ has been resurrected. Or like the idea of love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, especially in certain parts of the world where you're, where the, where some enemies are, are violently committed to making sure that you don't exist anymore. Loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you doesn't seem to really make sense, except Christ has been resurrected. And you could go rid of, you, you can make those things about the fact that whoever wants to be the greatest of all must be, has to be the servant of all. Right? It, the, it makes sense if Jesus has been resurrected. Everything that we do, every act of faithfulness makes sense because Christ has been resurrected. And you could keep running right on down the line. Let me give you an example. Um, a few weeks ago, we had the Crognollies with us, Dino and Janice Crognolly, Dr. and Dr. Crognolly. And um, so I had a chance to have lunch with Dino before they came, uh, uh, about a month, six weeks before they came. And then I had a chance to eat with them after they were here on that day. And so, and I don't remember when he told me this story, this part of their story. But, you know, the two of them met when they were students at UMass Medical School. And... And they got married, 
And as, a, and as a part of that journey, and he had had this long-standing desire to invest his life in missions. And, when, and, and so when they finished up their residencies, and it was not, they could go out and be real doctors finally, right? And they told all of their colleagues and their fellow students at UMass that they were going to go to Africa and serve as missionaries in a faith-based hospital. What do you think all their colleagues said? You're going to do what? Right? You're going to do what? That doesn't make any sense at all. Why, why would you have to do that? Why are you going to go do that? Right? It, it, it didn't make any sense. So what makes sense of it? The fact that there is a living Savior who sent a counselor to guide us, called the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, to guide us into all truth and to show us God's plan for us. And that Spirit had spoken to them and said that God wanted them to invest their medical gifts serving in Kenya and to use it as an opportunity to share the gospel in that region of the world. That's why it makes sense. And the only reason why that makes sense is because Christ is no longer in the grave, but he's on the throne. right? And it's the exact same stuff for us. What we do, what God asks us to do is a part of our faithfulness. Every act of faith makes sense because God has been resurrected. Even more so, let me, let me unpack it. It's not only that it makes sense, but it's actually worth it, right? It, 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 it is an investment in a spiritual treasure. Well, look what Paul says as he goes along here. He says, you know, so we, we got this whole illustration over here of the baptism of the dead. And we're like, oh, man, it's making our head explode if you really care about what it really means. It makes your head explode. I can't figure it out. And then he turns around and says, well, you know what? Let me ask you this question. Think about the apostles. Think about me. Think about Peter and John and James and Matthew and all those guys. Think about the apostles. He said, says, says, why are we in danger every hour? He says, I face death every day. As surely as I may boast about you, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus as a mere man, in other words, I wasn't doing it because God put me there. I just happened to be there because I wanted to be there. It was just my will, not God's will. He says, you know what? He says, if I find, what good does that do to me, for me? So here's this point. He said, you know, he said listen, we as, the, we as apostles and you as the followers of Christ, you are putting your lives at risk every single day by sharing the gospel. And guess what? You're not doing it just because it's your idea. You're doing it because God has sent you. And therefore, it has value. He has this illustration here about the wild beasts in Ephesus. As far as we know, the Apostle Paul never fought in the arena. Doesn't mean that he didn't. He might have. You remember the Romans used to love to put prisoners and that kind of stuff in the arena, and they'd send in wild animals, and that was their form of entertainment. We just have violent movies now, but that's what they did. They went and saw it in real life, right? And so, and, and, um, and he, we don't have any record that he necessarily did that, but, but he may have. There are some legends around that when he was in the arena, the animals refused to attack him, right? And that kind of idea. But we do know that in Ephesus, because of the impact of the teaching of Paul in the city, there was a riot. There was a riot. You go look at Acts chapter 19. There was a bona fide riot, right? And they were looking for people to tear limb from limb because they were messing with the economy that was built around idol worship in their city. And they, and they were going to lose their livelihood. They were going to lose their fortunes. They were going to lose their lives. It was going to impact their families. They were ripping mad. They were looking for somebody to tear apart limb from limb. Paul said, well, why am I doing that? Why am I putting my life at risk every single day if Jesus isn't resurrected? Because then it's not God's idea. It's my idea. And you know what that makes me? An idiot. Right? An idiot. I am risking my life for a lie. That makes me an idiot. Right? Paul said, but that's not the case. I'm not doing it as a mere man. God has called me as an apostle, and he sent me out. And every single risk I take in sharing the gospel is worth it 
because God has put me there. And sometimes you think about the changes that God's making you, asking you to do in your life, the commitments he's asking you to do your, in your life, the kind of service. I said, man, you know, I, so it's worth it. I want to tell you, it's worth it. It is worth it because Christ has been raised. So he doesn't stop there. Look at verses 33 and 34 with me. It says, don't be deceived. It says, make sure that you get what you believe right. And so he goes on to say, so he says, bad company corrupts good morals. Right? And that, that is an old adage. It was around before Paul spoke it. It's, it's still around today. It was kind of, he, let, me, let me interpret it for us. Make sure you're careful about where you get your theology from. Right? Make sure you're very careful about where you get your beliefs about God from. I heard a great quote from Tim Keller that my wife read to me. He says, you know what? If, if the God you believe in has not made you feel, in, feel uncomfortable in a while and challenged you, in all likelihood, all you're doing is worshiping an idealized version of yourself. You've just taken all the stuff that you want to believe and the stuff you like and the stuff that makes you comfortable and you've just, imp ju you've just kind of put that all and you've just imposed it on God. The God who really is is a God who is going to challenge you. Be careful what you believe and be careful what, where you get it from. And then he goes, doesn't stop there. He says, come to your senses. I like there's another translation of this. It says, be right-minded, right? And stop sinning, for some people are ignorant around God. This is a plea from the Apostle Paul for us to see life through the lens of faith, right? He's saying, you know, come to your senses. Understand what really matters in life. You know, and I don't know if you ever heard the phrase, but I wish I knew then what I know now, right? I would have been a little different back then, right? I would have done something a little different back then. He's saying, you already have an opportunity to see the now, right? Because you have a relationship with the eternal king. Now turn around and put that backwards onto where you are in this moment and don't have those moments. Come to your senses, right? See life through faith and say, man, you know, and listen, you know, I, I, I've, all of us experience this, right? Some of them are, are funny things, right? Like, I really wish I hadn't put my girlfriend, I, I wish I hadn't gotten my high school sweetheart's uh, initials tattooed to my arm because she landed up marrying somebody else, right? I didn't do that, right? But there's some people out there who have done that, say, if I only knew then, right, what I knew now, or sometimes it's much sadder, right? Like smoking and cancer. If I had just accepted it then, as I do now, I would have been much more motivated to quit back then. You see that? He's saying, listen, you, you have access to the one who's not in the grave anymore, but he's sitting on the throne. And he's sent the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to be a teacher and a guide and a leader in our lives. And we can know now, right? So we don't have to worry about the thens in the back. And he said, live your life. Right? What we believe is vital. And it's important that we get it right so that we don't have regrets when we stand before the king. But we just have gifts to bring them as a result of the acts of faithfulness that are always worth it in the eyes of God. Look at the way he concludes our little section, and we're going to wrap up with this today. I say this to your shame. The Corinthian church, if you read the whole book, they, they were not what you would call a church that was ready for the cover of the Christian magazines, right? <laughs> they, they had... They had 
they were divided and they were fighting and there was jealousy and there was heresy and 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 they were you know there was gross immorality in the church it was all kinds of stuff right when they got together to do the lord's supper and they were having a meal together it turned out to be like a drunken kind of thing and it, it, they, they were they were a train wreck right and he says it all comes back to the fact that you just don't have it right before god to your shame. And he says, so I say all of this stuff to your shame. And my, I, I want to flip this, say, let God deal with your shame today. There's probably, there's probably none of us in this room that would say, I'm exactly where God wants me to be in my journey. There's always another step to take. And we say that to our shame. Let God deal with our shame today. If, you, if you've never stepped out of death into life, if, you, if, if you've never embraced the implications of what it means that Jesus is no longer in the grave, but he's been resurrected, that he's not a victim, but that he is indeed a savior, and you've never embraced him as your savior, let God deal with your shame today. Embrace him as your savior. And listen, it, you know, it, it's, it's simply a matter of saying, you know what? I know I need a Savior. I have shame. And that shame is well earned. And with that, I need forgiveness. And it comes in Jesus Christ. And you ask for that forgiveness sincerely from your heart toward Jesus as the, as the Savior. And with that, you invite him into your life by faith. And your shame is dealt with. For those of us who are saying, you know, I... Faith is something in my life, but it's not all of my life. Let Jesus deal with your shame today. Because every act of faithfulness makes sense because of the resurrection. And everything that you do to pursue faithfulness is worth it. Because Jesus has been raised. Let's pray together. God, today we give you thanks that Jesus has been raised. Deal with our shame as we place our faith in you and we give our lives to you through faith. As we pray in the name of the one who is no longer in the grave but is resurrected and sits at the right hand of the Father, Jesus Christ, the Messiah who rode into the city of God. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen.